Lesson 8. In this lesson, we will be talking about uh, driving in emergency mode and some of the things we get to do with the exemptions. However, we still will not be talking about high-speed pursuits and driving really, really fast and flipping ambulances and all that fun stuff. Um, every time you go out on a call, it's going to be different. And this is something we, we try to stress in class that no two EMS calls are ever, ever, ever going to be alike. So no matter how good of a simulation we may have or how much we may describe a certain such th thing such as like chest pain, it's always going to be a little bit different. There will be something that's different. And that goes for driving too. Every call will be a little bit different. So that being said, it's good to have some um, clearly defined procedures when we're driving so we kind of know what to do when these unusual situations hit us. Um, generally, this is stuff that's going to be described in your um, uh, standard operating procedure, standard operating guidelines, your policy manual, uh, whatever your service calls it. Um, but they will describe when and when not it is, it is acceptable for your service to do certain things or for you to do when you work for their service. We'll talk about what we can do at the state level though because we have lots of exemptions. So when we're in code 3, which in Alabama means you're driving lights and sirens. There is a code two, which is lights only, and law enforcement officers are allowed to use that if they feel that the siren might alert the bad guy to the uh, arrival of them, and then the bad guy would run away before they could catch him. So police officers can run lights only. However, in Alabama, for an ambulance, we have to have lights and sirens. There is no code two for ambulances. So when we're doing this, the idea is, is we let other people know we're, we're coming, and hopefully they will get out of the way for us. They will yield the right of way. Um, again, we can't demand it. We can't force them off the road. We can't push them out of the way. That would be kind of fun if we could do that, but we can't. So hopefully they will get out of the way. There is a law saying there is a failure to yield, but um, what would have to happen there is you would have to be responding to emergency. A police officer would have to see somebody not getting out of your way and then go ahead and pull that person over and take them and in general, that's just a rare, rare situation. Um, however, most people will get out of the way um, if they realize you're there. So that means that they've seen, either seen your lights or they've heard your siren. And I want you to remember, cars are built pretty, pretty soundproof nowadays, and it's hard to hear that siren. Um, that being said, they also need a little bit of time to figure out what they need to do because they just can't jerk it to the right and get out of the way. Although sometimes they do that and then they cause a wreck. Um, but they hopefully they're gonna look and make sure it's clear and then get out of the way. Um, something that we can help prevent or, or, or minimize, I guess, is our stress response. Now, stress is good. It helps us perform a little bit better up to a point. And when we start getting our stress that causes heart rates to get up to 130, 140 beats a minute, we're starting to get almost overstressed and we lose fine motor control. We get tunnel vision and our peripheral vision. And lots of bad things can happen when our heart rates start to get up too high because of too much stress. So, to keep our heart rates down, when the tones go off, take a slow, deep breath, count of four, hold it for a count of four, exhale for a count of four. Some people will call that box breathing. Inhale for four, hold for four, exhale for four, hold for four, inhale for four, and you keep doing that four and four and four. Um, so take a deep breath and move purposely to the ambulance, but we do not run. When we run, we have more adrenaline, when we have more adrenaline, then we have more issues with not being able to look for things like scene safety issues and not having good motor control so we can't perform the techniques we need to perform. Um, our, our brain starts to shut down with higher levels of stress because we really don't need our brain to run or to fight. Um, in fact, it kind of gets in the way, so it, it begins to shut down. We focus on just the critical stuff right in front of us, and that's not what we need to be doing when we're driving. So remember this course was written in 1995, and at that time, in 1995, their studies show that you had to be within 33 feet of the vehicle in front of you for that vehicle to hear you, or the driver of that vehicle to hear you. Um, so I just want you to think of how much better soundproofing is for cars nowadays than it was in 1995. So you're probably going to have to be even closer than 33 feet before they hear you. Now, um, when you're not in emergency mode, we follow the speed limit. And if the speed limit is 55, we're supposed to travel 55. I know most people don't do that. They're usually five to 10 miles an hour over. But I want you to realize that if you were driving 56 miles an hour, you are violating the law. 
you're breaking the law and you can't get a ticket for that. And we are starting to see police officers that will ticket ambulances that are not running an emergency and don't have a patient but are exceeding the speed limit. Um, some people feel that because they're an ambulance, police officers will have, I don't know, I guess professional courtesy and won't give them a ticket. So they'll be coming back from a call, maybe they're coming back from a transfer to Huntsville or something, and they'll be running 75 miles an hour in a 55, and that's just dangerous, and they should get a ticket. Um, we're beginning to see where police officers would do that, and I think that's good. Now, when we're running in emergency mode, we can um, disregard this controlled intersection thing. So a controlled intersection is one with a red light or a stop sign, and obviously then we're supposed to stop. But in emergency mode, we have an exemption that says we don't have to stop. In fact, it doesn't say anything else. It just says we don't have to stop. So we can go through it as fast as we want. However, if you go through a red light at 70 miles an hour, you um, can still be held civilly liable for any damages you do. So running through a red light is just a dumb thing to do. Don't do it. 60% of the crashes that we have with other vehicles occur at these controlled intersections, and that makes sense in that most people are not expecting an ambulance as they go through the intersection. I don't know if you could stop at green lights and look both ways to see if it's clear in your normal driving. I'm, I mean, I usually don't. If I see a green light, I'm happy. I don't have to stop. I just go through it. Um, so that's what people are kind of expecting, and then the ambulance comes out of nowhere and T-bones them. So even though we are allowed to go through a red light, and we do go through red lights, we have to do so with due regard. And it, this basically says, I think we talked about this in lesson three, um, that a reasonably careful person performing similar duties under similar circumstances would act in the same manner. And what gets us here, or what we need to pay attention to, is that reasonably, a reasonable, careful person. So if you are ever in a wreck, they're going to look at things like, what were you taught in the EVOC course? What did I say in the, in the class? What was in the EVOC manual? How would other EMTs and paramedics have approached that same situation? And hopefully we all kind of are in agreement that if there's a red light, we should slow down and probably stop. Now, there's a few times I don't come to a complete stop, but I'm probably going less than five miles an hour. Um, so... Slow down, stop, make sure it's clear, then go through. Now, nationally, again, this is 95. This is kind of the consensus that we came up with. So a bunch of um, expert ambulance drivers got together and decided, hey, what should we do? So you have your siren in a whale mode, which is kind of a, a high-low. It goes up and it goes down, it goes up and it goes down. And then when we get 150 feet away from that, we go to a yelp, which is a very short blast type sound. We continue that yelp mode until we get to the crosswalk line, and then we hit two blasts of the air horn. At that point, you make sure that everybody has stopped. You clear the first lane by making eye contact with the drivers and making sure they've stopped. Stay in yelp mode. You go to the second lane, make sure the drivers there have stopped. A third lane, if there's a third lane, a fourth lane, a fifth lane, a sixth lane, however many lanes there are you're having to cross. You, you come to basically a stop at each lane and make sure everybody has, has stopped. And then once you reach the last lane, you proceed out of the intersection at a slow rate of speed. Don't accelerate up to the speed limit. Um, now you'll see that when you do your clinicals, most of the people driving the ambulance are probably doing all sorts of different things as they approach the, the intersection and they're bouncing back and forth between about three or four different siren tones and hitting the air horn a lot. Um, the idea is they're, they're trying to just let people know they're there. And if you hear a bunch of different sounds and noises, um, oftentimes that will attract people's attention better. Um, if you stay in one siren mode for too long, people can begin to drown it out. Um, <clears throat> there may be other uh, vehicles and other ambulance, fire trucks, police cars, all, all common nowadays since we're all going to the same call. So look for other emergency vehicles approaching the intersection because they're not completely stopping either. Now, if you have somebody that is stopped, um, we want to avoid passing on the right. So if that car is stopped, we want to go around to the left. If you go around to the right, there's a possibility that, that car will pull to the right, which is what they're supposed to do. So always pass on the left. Now, um, you have a car that is stopped and you need to make a right turn. We pass on the left and then we make our right turn in front of them. Make sure that that guy right there knows 
why you're or where you're going and that he is completely stopped because a lot of times he'll start proceeding um, starting to ease forward as you pass him and then you'll you'll get t-boned by him um, people turning left in front of you as they're making their turns um, they may continue that turn trying to get out of your way um, so make sure that they are fully stopped before you pull out in front of them and then there might be things like pedestrians and street signs and stop and go lights and all that other other hazards in the intersection to watch for now going into oncoming traffic is a, a, a bit of a rush um, it's good for the adrenaline um, and most people when they see an ambulance heading straight for them will get out of the way because we're bigger than most vehicles however you are doing something that most people don't anticipate, which is you're driving straight at them. Um, so this is, again, not normal. This is sort of abnormal driving. So people, um, you have to do this with due regard. Um, it can be done, and we do this a lot at intersections when traffic is really, really backed up. Um, just be very careful as you approach that intersection because people aren't looking for somebody in the wrong lane. Um, if you're going down the wrong way in a one-way street, again, another kind of good adrenaline rush, make sure you're doing it slowly. Um, not you know, we're, We have the exemption. We can do that, and sometimes we do that, but just make sure you do it slowly because people just generally aren't anticipating a car heading the wrong way down the one-way street. We'll talk about some traction vision issues. Um, things that can affect our traction, obviously snow and ice, um, we get that, especially down here when we get lots of ice, but rain can do it, high winds. Uh, these ambulances are much taller than your normal vehicle and uh, can be um, pushed very easily by the wind. Um, I've noticed this a lot going over bridges. You'll, you'll catch a, a crosswind and it, it pushes the ambulance quite a bit. So if we think we're gonna lose traction, we wanna slow down, just be driving slower in general, um, and realize it's gonna take longer to slow down, longer to accelerate, and if we're going around a corner, we have to go much slower because we're, we'll slide with that centrifugal force. So one of the things you can do is snow tires or snow chains. Um, I was born and raised in Wisconsin, and every October or so when the snow started, we'd put the snow tires on the car, and you'd take your, your regular tires home, and they'd get stored in the garage until about May when you'd go back to the service station, and they'd change out your tires, just something we did twice a year. Um, and in Wisconsin, it was illegal for us to have chains, so we never rode with chains. I never had chains on the, on the tires, just something we didn't do. Uh, when we got to front wheel drive cars, they had much better traction. The snow tires weren't as good as they used to be, or weren't as, there wasn't as much of a difference, so we didn't have to do that anymore, and they just had better tires nowadays. So I come down here, and the first time we get a decent um, ice storm and snowstorm, um, they put chains on all the tires. I'm thinking, well, this would be interesting. Um, and yes, you do have really good traction with chains on the tires, but it is an extremely bumpy, noisy ride. You feel like you're driving in the tank. So, um, don't like to use them, but I understand uh, why they do, because on ice, it yeah, just really isn't much you can do with ice. So if you end up skidding, which sometimes happens, we don't have quite enough weight on the front tires, and they go one, you turn it one way and the ambulance goes the other, um, typically the, the way to fix that is take your foot off the accelerator and turn your wheels into the direction you are skidding. And sometimes that will help to pull you out of it. In fact, if you have a front wheel drive car, most people nowadays will recommend even some gentle acceleration to try to pull your way out of the skid. Um, although I think for testing purposes, uh, just take your foot off the brake and turn into the skid. Now, if you have hot weather and you have something like this bleb show up on your tire, um, we should be inspecting our, free, our tires more frequently in hot weather because as the um, tires heat up, the um, air in them expands and then it puts more pressure in the tires and they're more likely to rupture. And... Um, if you see something like that bleb in there, you definitely want to get your tires changed. Um, and just, just one thing to realize, most ambulance services put a bid out, so you are working for a place that probably has bought the cheapest vehicles and tires and equipment that they could, um, the lowest bidder. Um, so when you're traveling 75 miles an hour down the highway, just realize you're in the lowest bidded vehicle that they could, that they could justify. Now, driving at night, we've already talked about the vehicle and the driver some. Um, we'll mention a few other things about driving at night. Um, night driving, obviously, without the light, um, we can't can't see the thing, so it conceals the hazards. We don't know what's in the road. It's just harder. When you do see something, it's harder to determine what it is. Um, other vehicles tend to look like they're traveling much slower than they really are um, at night, so you might want to give yourself a little bit more time before you pull out in front of someone. If you're a smoker, your peripheral vision is reduced even more, so try not to do that. Um, 
and, and adequate lighting um, or glare, uh, a couple of things we can do there. Try not to look into the headlights of the approaching vehicles coming straight at you. Try to look at the um, <clears throat> the lane marker, not the lane marker in the middle of the road, but the, I don't even know what you call it, the one on the side of the road, I guess the, maybe it's just the side of the road marker. Um, but look at that one to make sure you don't drive off the road and you stay in your lane, uh, but try not to look into the headlights. Um, dimming your dash and, and panel lights helps to preserve your, your night vision. It also keeps it a little bit safer for you if there is somebody out there attempting to do something bad. They can't really see into the cab as well, um, so maybe they can't uh, acquire a target and take a shot at you or something like that. Um, but it does help with the driving um, where you have better night vision with that. Keeping your windshield clean is really important. I recommend at the beginning of every shift, just get out the windshield or glass cleaner. You already have a towel in the ambulance, so go ahead and spray the windshield, clean it, wipe it down. Because you won't notice that it's dirty until that night when you're trying to drive and you can't see. So just do it every shift. Um, you're looking as far as you can down the road. I'm still thinking that 2412 rule, although um, you may have a hard time seeing 12 seconds ahead of you with the headlights you have. Some ambulance stations, when the tones go off, the um, building lights up, and that's kind of nice. It'll wake you up, um, no doubt about that. Uh, but the problem with that, um, although it's great to be able to get out to the ambulance and get into the ambulance with the lights on so you can see what you're doing, you don't trip over things, but then when you pull out of the ambulance, you're in the dark. So you went from a very bright environment to a dark environment, and it can take a few seconds for your, your night vision to kick back in. So um, try to, if your station does that, try to keep your ambulance bay as dark as you can, and then when you do pull out of the ambulance bay, you might need to give yourself a few seconds to allow your vision to um, return back to its night vision. Um, and, you know, there's a rule, uh, or if there's a rule, somebody had to have done it, so somebody must have worn their sunglasses at night, and that's why we have a rule about don't wear sunglasses at night. Now, rain and fog, um, obviously they, they block our vision some, so we want to um, go a little bit slower with it. And uh, I want to mention one thing. Um, headlights, if you are using your high beams, sometimes they can reflect off this fog and it bounce back into your eyes and it's kind of hard to see. So you might want to try your low beams, but, but try both and see which one looks better for you. Um, but most ambulances have a primary and a secondary or a high power and a low power. And they do that um, in part because of this. If you're in primary or high power mode, the strobes are really bright. And on a foggy situation like this, it can be hard to, to see because the strobes are getting flashed back into your own eyes. So you may want to switch to secondary or low power, and it might help you see a little better as you drive. Again, play with both and see what works for you. So the recommendation is if the roads are, roads are wet, sorry about that, roads are wet, it's talking like Elmer Fudd. Um, if the roads are wet, reduce your speed by one third. If you have snow on it or ice on it, they say by half, um, and I think I disagree with that. I think if it's icy, you probably need to drop it down to maybe one tenth of what you normally drive. Um, snow is not too bad, but if you have ice down there, it, it's really, really, really hard to drive on that. Um, <clears throat> knowing that there is a possibility of a wreck, of, of you crashing, um, and it's going to be an increased possibility if you have poor vision and poor weather, again, make sure that, that you are um, well prepared and you're seat belted in and everything is secured in the ambulance. Um, you may use your low beams versus your high beams. Uh, make sure you change your windshield wipers frequently on your ambulance. Um, if you have really bad rain or fog or something, some people just stop. Um, hopefully they pull off the side of the road before they stop, but sometimes they don't, so we have to anticipate that. Um, and then there are some people that just won't slow down at all, no matter how bad the rain or the vision is. Um, and those are the ones that are really, really dangerous. So um, keep an eye on what's going on around you um, and keep moving slowly if you can. However, if it does get too bad and you can't move at all, you may be able to pull over and park, but make sure you pull over first and don't stop in the middle of the road. Um, although, being in an ambulance, um, we don't get too many options of just not responding. Uh, if it is too dangerous, we will stop, pull over and stop, but we try to keep going towards the scene if we can. <clears throat> Mention the windshield wiper or the windshields, making sure we keep those clean. Uh, change off your wipers frequently. Of course, you don't know you need new wipers until it starts to rain and you can't see. And you think, oh, I'll get that changed next time it's clear. Um, go ahead and do it. Do it frequently. Um, your visors, try to have your visor tilted away from you and towards the window. Um, if it's tilted towards you when you pull it down, you can hit your head on it. It can scalp you. 
Um, I don't see too many bug screens on ambulances, so I don't think that'll be a problem. Um, keep your headlights clean too, but hopefully if we clean our ambulances every shift like we're supposed to, then they'll stay clean. Oh, um, we want to try and drive slowly, carefully, cautiously, um, or s as slowly as we can. We never want to so, uh, sacrifice safety for speed. Safety is more important than speed. Um, again, secure your equipment, make sure everything's tied down, it's not going to go flying around and hit you, wear your seat belts, um, kind of mentally prepare what's going to happen if you were to hit something, keep your space cushion around you, and if you are backing up, use that ground guide. If you see like you're about to, to hit something, we want to reduce our speed, we want to reduce the angle of the impact, and we want to try to um, hit something soft versus something hard if we can. Um, now that being said, Sometimes, like if you're going through an intersection, you may see a car approaching you, maybe from the right or something, and um, instead of just slamming on the brakes and stopping in the middle of the road and letting them hit you, sometimes accelerating and getting yourself pulled out of the intersection before they get into it is, is the way to go. You'll have to make that determination when it happens, but sometimes accelerating is the way to get out of it. And if you can swerve around it, that's even better. If you run off the side of the road, it happens. Um, it's okay. Take your foot off the accelerator. Um, Keep driving on the road as long as it's safe to do so. There's nothing coming up that you can run into. Uh, when you get control of the ambulance again, signal, make sure it's clear, and then you pull back onto the road firmly, but make sure you don't overcorrect and either flip the ambulance or pull all the way across the road into oncoming traffic. And let's talk about a few kind of bad situations that can happen. If your tire blows out, um, just take your foot off the accelerator, downshift, signal, pull off the side of the road. Do not slam on the brakes. I know it's kind of tempting when something goes wrong just to hit the brakes, but if that happens, you can go into a bad skid. Um, if the brakes fail, you press on the brakes and nothing happens, um, you can downshift, you can have the emergency brake, because um, that works a different system than your regular brakes, and then you can try to find something soft to run into, or maybe run into a field or, or something like that. Um, some people say just go ahead and drop it into neutral, um, which is okay, um, or into park, but you can't do that with newer vehicles. You used to be able to do that with old vehicles. Yes, you will ruin your transmission, probably your tires, but if you're about to hit a, a school bus or something, that would, that would be a good option, but um, we don't have that choice much anymore. If your steering, steering fails, um, make sure you slow down, signal, um, and, and stop as quickly as you can. If for some reason your accelerator gets stuck, you can try downshifting, you can try putting it in a neutral. Some people will say to turn it off before you, you um, and then that should hopefully reset the engine. The problem with turning it off is that you also lose your power brakes and your power steering, and your steering may go ahead and lock up on you. Now, if your hood pops up, like the poor guy in this, this picture, um, <laughs> avoid the temptation to stick your head out the window and see what's coming because the thing that's coming may take your head off. So you can try to look underneath it. Sometimes you can get a little bit of a field of view underneath it. Otherwise, you need to stop about as quickly as you can, just because you can't see what's coming. When you pull off the road, and this is one of the times that we can um, turn off the siren. So if you're like on a scene of a wreck, um, you can stop your ambulance, put it in park. You can have just the lights going. You don't have to have the siren. So figure out where you're going to exit, signal it, and just do it smoothly as you do it. Now, as if you are on the scene, you actually want to park in the traffic path to try to keep the scene safe. We'll talk about that in another chapter or another lesson. Um, but if you're just getting off the side of the road, then make sure you're out of the way. Um, <clears throat> I worked in Birmingham. We had a really big ambulance service, and it was really, really kind of nice as, as EMTs and paramedics because there's this big warehouse. At the end of your shift, you just pulled in, and you went up to a counter, and you returned to your um, jump bag, which had your drug box in it and your narcotics in it, and um, signed for that, and they would take the keys, and then they would clean it, and restock it, and um, get it ready for the next next crew. Um, so we didn't have to do any of that, and that was really kind of cool. Um, at the beginning of the shift, the same thing, you walked up to the counter, they gave you your um, jump bag, and your drug box, and narcotic box, that was all in that, and you signed for it, and they gave you a set of keys, and said, your ambulance was out in the parking lot, and you went and got it. Uh, but there was one of them, I think it was 476, that had been around since, like, the Flintstones. It was just a, a beast of an ambulance, and many, many crews had tried to kill it by, like, running into buildings and, and dropping it into park and running into curbs, and n nothing could kill this ambulance. 
So one day I went into work, my partner and I went up to the counter and we got the keys and it was 476. And we're like, no, it's not our time yet. And the guy said, yes, yes it is. Get in your truck and stop whining. So we went out to the truck and we put ourselves in service and dag nabbit, first call was to go down to Tuscaloosa and pick up someone and bring them up to UAB. So we had this kind of, not really out of town transfer, but we were gonna be in this awful truck for a little while. I mean, it didn't have air conditioner, didn't have a radio that we could listen to music. It was just, oh, um, old beat up, nasty smelling truck. So we're heading down I-59 and we started smelling something. I, thought, I wonder what that is, it kind of smells like smoke. Um, so we went on a little bit further and then we noticed that the dash was starting to glow a little bit and get really warm and there were like flames. So then we went, oh, the ambulance is on fire. So we pulled over and we jumped out and um, I don't know what I was thinking. I guess I wasn't thinking I had not planned for an ambulance fire, but I opened up the back cabinet, the back, uh, back door and I jumped in the back of the ambulance and I grabbed my jump bag, which had my narcotics in it because it's a real pain to have to um, deal with lost narcotics. And with my other hand, I grabbed my heart monitor because you know it's a twenty-five thousand dollar piece of equipment. Uh, the ones nowadays are probably pushing forty thousand. Um, what I didn't notice as I climbed into the ambulance and then came back out is there was a little fire extinguisher right by the door. Never crossed my mind. Um, so we jumped out and ran down into the ditch and looked around and thought, hey, we should call. And we thought, mm, maybe we ought to wait a minute. No, we, we, we did call. Um, we called dispatch and said our ambulance was on fire and they didn't believe us at first. And then they asked us where we were. And we're like, oh, I don't know. We're on I-59 somewhere. Just tell them to head southbound. They'll find it. Um, I don't think our ambulance ever got as bad as the one here in the picture, but um, ambulance fires do happen. Um, we have oxygen on them, so that makes them worse. And your first priority is to get everyone out. So get out of the ambulance. And then if you are trained and so equipped and you want to try and put it out, go for it. But you have to get everybody out. If you're looking for a piece of equipment, um, and I don't rec really recommend this, but if you can do it safely, your monitor is expensive. Your stretchers are generally about ten dollars to $12,000. Um, drug boxes really aren't that expensive. It's just a pain to replace all the narcotics if the narcotics burn up. But you got to get out safely. In the summer months, it's going to take a little bit longer to break because they need to absorb more heat. And if it's already hot outside, then they can't absorb it as quickly. So we may have to pump them a little bit and realize that these ambulances are much bigger than your cars. And the heavier the vehicle, the, um, the more heat they have to absorb and the longer it's going to take to slow down. So if you have any questions, message me on Moodle and I look forward to the next lesson.